Thanks a lot for the site board and all our musicians. And <laughs> myself, but anyway, we're happy for all. It sounds better when we have a lot of instruments, but yeah. I'm not trying to toot my own horn or anything, but I think it always sounds better when you've got plenty of instruments. We thank the Lord for all those who contribute. If you, you play something, even if it's only a, a pot, <laughs> and you can do it decently, you ought to do it. You ought to do it. So we encourage you to bring your horn and Guitar, banjo. I guess a banjo would be all right. Wish I could play one. Somebody gave me one, but I can't do the stuff like that on this end. And I've had trouble with that. Well, we're here to preach. The Lord's good. Yeah. His mercy will do it for you. I believe that. Amen. Amen. We thank the Lord for this. Beautiful day that He's given us. Thank God for the beautiful hymns of Zion that we've sung today. Praise God. It's been a good good time being together. I like singing. Singing the hymns of the church. And thank the Lord for being able to come together and do that. God, it's been a good day. I I uh, can't don't know what other people say because I know it was a very tough sermon this morning. But tonight's doesn't really let up that much. I believe today I've just dedicated this day to uh, reminding us as well as new folks that come into church. I was very encouraged this evening. You know how you know how I do. And I preach a hard message, then I go home, and then I, I fret. <laughs> and uh, I guess the devil makes me fret or tries to and says, boy, oh boy, you run them off now, boy. You, you took care of whatever good was going to ever be done. You did it today. You did it, and you did it right. And uh, But tonight, just before church, I didn't even get to come down to pray. One of our new converts who brought their whole family and sat across this front. We had a crowd here this morning. Amen. And this church was full. And and this lady come and had to sit in the front pew with her whole family. She's only been here three Sundays. Given her life to Christ. Five years ago, I visited her every day in the hospital, not to toot my horn, uh, when she had severe problems, had almost died three or four times. And through it, it took these five years. And here three weeks ago, she walked in church. Amen. And now today, she brought her whole family. And brought some of her girls, her one of her girl's boyfriend from Waynesburg. His family's talking about coming the next time with him. See, word spreads. Amen. You know? And this evening, about 6 o'clock, uh, not 6 o'clock, yeah. Uh, about 5 o'clock, I was getting ready to come down to the church in the foot of rain. This lady, picked, this lady called me. And she says, I wanted to call to tell you something, Reverend. I said, what? She said, she said, I've been, I've been what, thinking about making your church my church. And now I am going to make your church my church. <laughs> she says, I feel so comfortable and so confident knowing that I can go to a church where they preach the Word of God. Right. And she says, I will be back. My family will be back. And we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Praise the Lord. And so that sort of helped me get through all the stuff that the old devil tries to, to throw at me for preaching uh, things like that, especially current events in our society, which our society doesn't want to hear. Uh, I'm talking about the, the world uh, mostly. But even in the church, people can become insulted when you preach on these subjects. So, but we have to do it. It's God's Word. And if we avoid it, we're going to be held accountable. We have to preach the whole gospel. Amen. The whole gospel. If you have your Bibles tonight, take, go back with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I'd like to cap uh, this day of messages off with a message that's entitled, Is There Not a Cause? Is there not a cause? Remember this morning's message? Obscenities. I'm reading from the King James Version. I'd like to begin reading at verse 21. This is a very interesting portion of Scripture. When we get down to verse 23, we're going to buzz back over to verse 8 and just explain 
the words that they're talking about in verse 23. Follow me, please. 1 Samuel 17, 21. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array. Army against army. They had lined up probably one hill to the other hill facing each other. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words and David I'd like to paraphrase, just happened to hear it. I want you to bear on that. Now let's go back to verse 8 and find out the words that he spoke. And he stood and he cried. This is Goliath. And he stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel. And he said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. And if he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, and, and the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Mark that in your Bible. I'll tell you, brother, you look around, sister, you look around you today and see how the enemies of the church are openly and audibly defying, yeah. defying God and anything God stands for. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Let's go back now to verse 24. And all the men of Israel when they saw the man, fled from him, and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel has he come up. It says here is, but it sounds better to me has. I better read the right word, have not Israel is he come up. <laughs> and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the great king will enrich him with great riches. And will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. David spake to the men that stood by him. This was a whole bunch of, of uh, army men that were uh, the army that was standing side by side facing the Philistines. David spake to these men, ran into the middle of them that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who is it? How dare he defy the armies of the living God? The people answered him after this manner. In other words, they reiterated what Goliath had said in verses 8 and 9 and 10. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And then went on to explain that he would receive the king's daughter and a free house, no rent, free food, whatever else. Verse 28, And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thy heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. You've got to remember that David was just a teenager. He was just a young kid. All these men, including David's eldest brother, were lined up to fight this battle. Here comes this little, history says, he was freckle-faced with red hair. And he come down, running down, little short guy, come running down into the, you know, he didn't know. I, I should, I'd like to say he didn't know any better. You know, he was young, he was strong, he was, he was a burnt with a son, 
He was good to look upon, the Bible said. David was a man good to look upon. He was muscular, but he was young, just a young kid. He runs down in the middle of this army. Verse 29 says, And David said, he returned and responded, responded to his eldest brother. What have I now done? <laughs> Doesn't that sound like a family affair? You know? What have I now done? Here's the key phrase. Is there not a cause for this whole mess? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul. They ran and told Saul, and he sent for David. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. <laughs> Can you say amen? amen. Well, that's weak, but I'll tell you one thing. This little kid had a lot of guts, and he had a lot of God. Can you say amen? amen. You know, he didn't realize that he was about to be, he was about to be anointed king. This young kid. Just about. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless your word to us tonight. Make it real to us. Oh God, help me again. If that you, I will be your channel. Oh God, take this body of mine, this, this mind of mine, this voice. God, just make me your channel that your word can go forth unhindered. Today has been a day, Lord, when you have laid upon my heart messages, Lord, to alert our church. I can't speak to these other churches or these other pastors. That's not my place. God, you have given me responsibility over this flock. I must face that responsibility. I ask that these messages of today bring us current with the needs within our community, our society, and where the church stands in the midst of it all. I ask you now, Holy Spirit, to make your word open and understanding to every heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Is there not a cause? Again, I want to revert back to a man that uh, I never met, but yet his writings have, have just uh, really uh, done something for me. I read his book. i got two of his books now. And I read some of these. I preached for the Presbytery in Harrisburg here a couple of years ago. And I used a couple of these illustrations in that message and here I come to find out that after that message, Brother Bongiorno went and bought this book. That's how much it affected him. This Richard Halverson is uh, a chaplain for, for uh, I've told you, I can't, I've lost it. Sister Barb, I mean. uh, No, it's the, uh, it's the White House. It's uh, the, the Senate. Yeah, he's, I'm sorry, Barbara. you were close, but not quite. <laughs> uh, uh, he's the chaplain for the U.S. Senate. This guy is smart. Not only is he intelligent, but he's got a real experience with God. Here's what he says. A democracy is not a numbers game. Quality counts as well as quantity. If a thing is wrong, 10,000 people clamoring for it will not make it right. And if a thing is right, 10,000 people clamoring for it does not make it any more right. A good leader does not count opinion. This really touched me. A good leader does not count opinion, but weighs it. The trustworthy elected official never capitulates to numbers. True, he is elected to represent his constituency, but he certainly is not a trusted representative if he yields to their pressure when he believes they are wrong. Our republic desperately needs leaders who dare to do what they believe to be true and right and just, no matter how many oppose them. We urgently need leaders and people who dare to tell us what we need to hear, not what we want to hear. God, give us men and women who have the courage 
to take political risks, who dare to do the unpopular thing, who follow what they believe to be the way of justice and truth. Deliver us from those whose decisions are always expedient and political and never principled. Well, that's a powerful statement. Powerful statement. You say what you're reading for, Pastor, because that's what this sermon's about. You see, as this text unfolds and reveals in 1 Samuel chapter 17, Israel and the Philistines were at war, at the verge of a tremendous battle. And if you'll read your Bible, you'll find that this battle was one of the battles that was a key battle to Israel's futuristic success. Goliath, the great warrior and champion, steps forward, issues a challenge to fight. King Saul the, and the Israelites were filled with a chilling fear, which brought a spirit of confusion and doubt into the camp. If the leader can't lead, the people can't follow. All right. Amen. But the sheep have no one to follow. They scatter. David the shepherd boy saw the dilemma. And in verse 29 he asked, Is there not a cause? I'm reminded of words that St. Paul wrote way over 100, uh, 150, yeah, 1,500 years later. St. Paul writes these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Did all eat the same spiritual meat? And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with many of them, verse 5, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. They were overthrown in the wilderness. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there's a cause for everything. Nothing happens, you know I've said this and you believe it. I'm sure you do. There's not, there's not nothing that happens by chance. Everything that happens, there's a reason. Something caused it. And there are there is a cause in our text tonight for the condition surrounding David and King Saul. I'm going to get into this tonight. Please follow me. Number one, was there not a cause for the condition of David's country? If you'll turn with me back to 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. Was there not a cause for the condition of David's country under Saul, King Saul's leadership? It says this in verse 1, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And we all know who that king was. That was David, this young kid that took care of the sheep out on the countryside. Ladies and gentlemen, just as today, David's society, under the leadership of King Saul, David's society was surrounded and controlled by giants. Politically, socially, in the area of drugs and demon possession and depression and discouragement and sex and alcohol and political weakness. I'm amazed when I listen to the news. You know, uh, uh, people... People don't like what's happened in the news concerning our leadership, but they like what our leadership is doing for the country. That's what they say. 78% of the people last week that were censored on whether they support the leadership of our country said yes. I know that those polls, they only take like maybe a thousand people, 500 people, or I'm not sure how many they use. 
But they say that those statistical polls usually bear true. And that when they pick out a, just a mass of people out of a town or a city area, that that represents pretty well what's going on. And whether that's true or not, I don't know. If it's true, then I'd say the church is in a little bit of a bad mess. I'll tell you what controls our country today, ladies and gentlemen, the pocketbook. That's what controls our country. That's what controls people's thinking. And because things are good right now, they'll put up with the man. They'll overlook it. Because everything's good. Got a job, making money. Things are going pretty fair. I will overlook the rest of it. Is this what the Bible says? In my text this morning, it says, partake not. When you go into that country, partake not of their money. Now, I, I understand we've got to work in our society. Jesus said, be in the world and not of it. That means you've got to go to work. You've got to, you've got to make your money. You've got to take care of your family. But I'll tell you, when it comes to making decisions, we've got to know where we stand. Somewhere. We've got to know where we stand. I don't want to spend too much time on this. What was the condition of David's country? I'll tell you what the condition of David's country was. The fact that King Saul had lost his ability to read. Spiritually. And when he lost that spiritual leadership, the country became weak. When one man could walk into the trench and cause all the armies of Israel to turn and to flee at the top of the hill. Something's wrong. And you know, folks, with as much as we hear about revival, and thank God for the revival that's going about, and I believe revival is different for each church. You know, I don't know whether you understand what I'm trying to say that much. You know, I can't go to Brownsville and take a suitcase and bring back Brownsville for you and us. It just don't work that way. God's got what He wants for this church, just like He does for the church up north or anywhere else. We've got to seek for that. Mm -hmm. But I'm convinced of something. I believe that in the midst of all this, if we become weak spiritually, if we become spiritually weak people, then the church becomes weak. And we become indecisive when it comes to making good, solid decisions about what's right, what's wrong. And it's creeping into our churches and our society today. I, I read it to you this morning. Just an example. <clears throat> Just as we might look at today's society, David's society was intimidated by Goliath, the enemy. Our society is also intimidated by giants of this world system. Surrounded by the soldiers, the world system itself, and the church sets back and says, what can we do? What can we do? We need to have a voice. I was offered an opportunity today to write a letter, and they will put it on the World Wide Web for me, responding to what I read to you this morning. And I'm going to do it. I'm not nearly as intelligent as that, as that uh, bishop. Not nearly. But I, if I can put the words together by the help of somebody, I'm going to respond from my heart on what, what I know what God's Word says. You see what makes the difference? is the fact that somebody can say, well, the Bible says that, but it's not true. But when you experience it in your heart, then you know it's true. Amen. You see, that makes the whole Amen. difference. That makes the whole difference. Amen. When you experience it in your heart, then you know it. it's Amen. true. And, and as a pastor, I've done it before and I'll do it again. I, I can't stand by and, and have something like that go on and not as a personal pastor respond in some way in my disagreement. I'm a Pentecostal preacher who believes that God is a holy God and that He's not only holy but divine. If that be the case, is it right for me to stand by and watch people all over the world and the United States read that on the World Wide Web and many of them will follow that and lose their faith in God? I can't stand by and let that happen, see? Number two. Not only 
only was there a cause for the condition of David's country, just as our own, but is there not a cause for confusion and disillusionment in our own community? I said this morning, and I back that. Thank God we live in a small community like we do. What we face here is nothing compared to what people face in large cities and metropolitan areas. To go to school and have to worry about somebody killing you every day, we don't have to worry about that here. I don't think, right? Do you hear of a lot of that going on here? I don't. There may be instances, maybe uh, once in a while, but we don't have that to worry about like they do in, in large metropolitan areas. Yet by the same token, our community, listen, our community is dying and going to hell. Right here. Right here. Right under our nose. That ought to touch us. That ought to speak something to us. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to change it? You see, it's hopeless to try to change our community without Jesus. It's hopeless. People have tried it before, and it doesn't work. You see, we're helpless to try to do it without someone with an answer. David walks into the middle of these people. This little kid, first of all, it was an insult to his older brother, let alone the rest of the men. This young brat walking in here saying, what's he going to do? He walks in the middle. Of, we're, we're the ones that know how to fight. We're the ones carrying the swords. Has anybody given him a sword yet? No. Here this little red-headed rascal walks into the middle of all these warriors and says, where is he? Where is he? He didn't say it quite as arrogant. He talked with the soul, got the answer. The people told him what was going on. He sent a message to Saul. Saul had him come up. And he patted Saul on the, as high as he could reach, probably his belt. And he says, don't worry. He says, I'll face it. I'll face it. You see, I'll do it, Saul. I'll do it in the name of the Lord. This isn't our path. It's the Lord's battle. That's what he said. How many believe that in the midst of a hellish society in which we live, that we can win the battle because it isn't our battle? It's God's battle. You see, God's church will go on. Not because it's our church. Oh, we, we say this is our church. And it's nice to believe this is our church as far as being members of this church. But this really, when you come down to it, this isn't our church, it's His church. Mm -hmm. You see, it's His church. Yes. If it's a blood-washed church, if it's a church making itself ready, making herself ready for the rapture, then it's not our church. We're His church. Mm -hmm. And we will never fall. Hallelujah. Not because of us, but because of Him. He's done one the battle for us. Hallelujah. He's done one the battle. Is there not a cause for all this? You see, whether it be our own community of Mount Morris or whether it be all around us, I believe personally, and I believe you do too, that, that, that our society and community and, and uh, environment, it's headed for destruction, doomed for hell, without the shepherd. In that case, that little shepherd boy came out and was the answer to that whole mess. Jesus Christ is the only answer to what needs to be done in our communities today, let alone our own church. Ladies and gentlemen, remember this. For the confusion and the disillusionment, you'd be surprised. You may sit here tonight and you say, well, I've heard this before. Let me tell you something. There are more people that used to go to church than we can count, that we can even put on paper, that are completely disillusioned about spiritual things. Right. And about religion. Many of them don't even want it anymore. Right. They don't want anything to do with church. Or God. Disillusionment. How do we beat that thing? How do we go into a community and persuade people who once were saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and now want nothing to do with God? We can't do it without Him. 
We need the shepherd of our soul to give us power. Remember the day you got saved. I'm not going to look through the audience and remember even uh, in the last year or two, people that have come to Jesus. What brought you to Him? The grace of God. Nothing any man could ever do brought you. It's for God's grace. Hallelujah. Number three. Is there not a cause for the lack of courage? Write it down if you wish. Is there not a cause for the lack of courage in the church today? Courage. Stand up. And fight the enemy. Is there a cause for this? There sure is. You may have heard this before, but it just sort of fits the, the place. The choice is simple. You can either stand up and be counted or lie down and be counted at and I think that's I think I've used that before. But that's a that's a good uh, anecdote and illustration. You see, ladies and gentlemen, uh, follow me very closely here. What it seems like I'm doing today is just plastering and demolishing the church. That's not my intention. I love you and I love God and I love our church. And I love the church in general. But you've got to admit, every time in the Bible that a prophet stood up and preached, what did he do? Somebody tell me out loud. When he, when he got up and gave a message to God, what usually was that message? Warning. There, thank you. Warning. 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 I remind you, I remind you, isn't it easy for us to forget? Yeah. Especially me. My wife was laughing at me. She knows how easy it is for me. She tells me to do stuff at home. And I don't know, I just forget it so quickly. It just seems to buzz. Right through. You see, in these last days, is there not a cause for the lack of courage? Here, here, follow me. Number one, the Bible says in the last days are going to be a great falling away. What is that? Has anybody ever taken the time to think of what that means? Everybody's got their idea of what that means. A great falling away. Maybe people don't shout as much. Maybe that's a falling away. I don't know. Except I only know what the word says. Yeah. When it says a great falling away, it means a falling away of true teaching. It means a falling away of true, honest, to goodness, solid doctrine. It means a falling away of godly living. That's the great falling away that the Bible is talking about. Secondly, is there not a cause for the lack of courage in the church today? There is a great forsaking. Generally speaking, I can't stand here and say that everything I'm preaching today or even very much of it would be evident in this church. We're a unique church here yet. I hope it continues that way. But there is a forsaking of God's Word. God's Word takes second place in many of our churches today. In many of our churches, God's Word takes second place to everything else. I'm telling you folks, I just can't gobble that up. Amen. I believe if any church is going to be strong, it's going to take God's holy word being preached, Amen. heard, and followed to make a solid church. Listen to me folks. Why is there a lack of courage? I believe there is a, a great famine in the church in general today. A famine of preaching. A famine of praying and a famine of holy Pentecostal power. Amen. Now listen to me. If you take away preaching from the church, and you take away praying from the church, and you take away Pentecostal power from the church, what in the world do you have left? Amen. You have nothing wow. but a form of God. Right. That's why the church doesn't have courage today. Like it ought to stand up against the enemy. There's a great fantasy creeping into the church today that has destroyed the courage that the church once had. We don't have to go to the whipping post or, or have 
wax poured on us and tied to a pole and put up in a courtyard and set on fire to make light, literal light, to play games. That's what the Christians had to go through with in the early days of the Pentecostal church. You've heard it before. For you that are new, don't forget. Read the book of martyrs. Fox's book of martyrs. It'll help. I tell you, those people had courage. There are people in parts of the world today that will give their lives just for one page of the New Testament. One page to be able to carry around their pocket. And today, the church in the United States of America has become fat and sassy. And we've forgotten what it is to really have courage. We haven't needed it. We come to church and hear our fancy sermon. And we make our prayers. And we sing a few songs and we go home and we've done our piece for the week. God help us because one of these days these kind of things will catch up with us. And one of these days, mark my words, I'm not a great prophet, but I know this. Before Jesus comes back, the church is going to face some tough times. There's going to be some difficult times in the United States of America. And we're going to have to stand up and be counted. And somebody's going to say, do you stand for Jesus Christ and this Pentecostal religion? Are you one of those fanatics? Either you'll say yes, or you'll slightly turn your head and say, God help us if you say no. Because I believe it was in the days of old. If we say no, we have written our doom. Never see that. What's the fantasy coming into the church? Apostasy. Follow me closely. Pastor, you, you, you're way off base. You need to tell me that you're going to stand here and tell us that a spirit of apostasy? What is apostasy? I don't want to interrogate you, but just take a moment. The word apostasy, what does it mean? Fall away. Dis disregard for God's word. Mm -hmm, exactly. It means to disregard God's word and fall away from God and to go completely the other way. And you know, folks, in this last day, apostasy is creeping in to the church. Listen to me closely. Every Sunday morning in churches around this country and world, people sit in a church, sit under the word of God, and walk out of the church without repenting. That's apostasy. Right. That's apostasy. And what is this apostasy for me? Slowly but surely, there are ranks being drawn out of the blood-washed church and are forming this great last church led by who? We preached it this morning. The false, whoever said that, the false prophet. Slowly but surely, this is happening. And you know, the baseline is, if the church doesn't have courage, then she must be succumbing to something else. Something is sapping her courage away. Something is taking her power away. We can't, I'm just saying we can't, and we thank God for what we enjoy here. But folks, let me tell you, it's getting harder and harder to pray for the sick and to believe God that they can instantly be healed. Why is that? Because of the great fantasy that's creeping into the church in general. It says you don't need this miracle worker. You've got too many other ways to get the job done. Then there's a fantasy of cults. I may have told you, but it's amazing. The church in Romney, West Virginia has been there. There's something about church. Has been there for Bruce, how many years has that church been there? What, 50? 60? Maybe more than that. 70? It's an older Assembly of God church. But in lately, every cult you can think of is building a church in Romney, West Virginia. Side by side. 
You can run down Route 50 and you can pass them. Jehovah's Witnesses. I lost track. What's that? The Mormons. You go on downtown and there are others. The spirit church. The, the demon worshipers. And they're building wonderful, beautiful complexes. And the church of Jesus Christ is struggling to keep its ears open. What in the world is wrong? You see what I'm saying? Something's wrong. Why should cults flourish in our town and take away our people? What's happened to our church if cults can rob us of our own people? And I know it to be a fact. There were people that knelt and elders when I was pastor there that are now members of the Jehovah's Witness. What's happened? Lost our courage. Lost our courage. The last fantasy that seems to be creeping into the church today, and we've preached it for many years, is compromise. Once you start compromising, you can't quit. You have to continue to do it. You just compromise to cover compromise. And you cover compromise to cover compromise. It's never popular to stand up and say, this is my stand. But until the church begins to do this, we're not going to have any final, solid direction. Right. God help us. What was the cause of David's country? One of the causes was the fact of a lack of courage. Nobody had the guts to stand up to the young man, right. except for that one little spiritual young man. Today we need courage. There's a great folly. Are you with me for a few minutes yet? Thank you. There's a great folly creeping into the church today. This folly is ignoring the call of Jesus. We need to pray for our young people. It's a struggle for our kids. It's a really struggle for them. My prayer is that they'll find this solid, Pentecostal, basic foundation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, over the years, I've found it to be true. I've been here for two, I've been two generations, I guess. And I find the hardest time to keep kids is after they graduate from high school. That's the hardest time to keep them. And a lot of times, we, we don't have control over that. And I guess none of us do. And I'll tell you something, folks. We can't afford, as adults in our church, we can't expect kids to lead for us. We must lead for them. Amen. We must set a powerful spiritual example for our kids. And if we don't, what in the world is going to happen to them in this age we live in? It's called following, ignoring the call of God. Then there's last but not least in this category. The church has nothing more than a debauched future to look forward to if something isn't done. I know this sounds really, poor Pastor, you're just, you're slamming the church. I'm not. I'm only saying, folks, listen to me. A debauched future for the church is on the way if she doesn't again find her courage to stand for Christ. Here it is. She'll miss the judgment seat of Christ and she'll meet the white throne guilty. It's in the Word. It's right there. There's no way to avoid it. God help us. Don't miss the judgment seat of Christ. That's where I want to be. Mm -hmm. That makes sure that I'm safe. That I'm ready to go. Fourthly, As I said before, we need to pray for our young people. Is there not a cause for the helplessness spreading throughout our youthful generation today? Kids are really hungry. 
And that's why they do what they do, a lot of them. Because they don't have leadership. And they're reaching out to whatever will give them satisfaction. Would you pray with me that the church in Mount Morris would offer spiritual satisfaction to our kids? Would lead them to Jesus. Amen. And there would, be, there would be no need to look elsewhere for anything else. God help me. Help my wife. Help our family. Help us in this age that we might see God fulfill everything He wants to do in our family, let alone anybody else. God save our families. Can you say that? Save our families. Oh God. Oh God. Just before I close tonight, There were three things that stood in David's way that never hindered him. Three things. I want to share them with you. These things literally stood in his way, but they never hindered his progress. First, internal fear. Internal fear. I want you to notice in our text in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. And they were so afraid. When David walked into the group, he never backtracked. He never ran. And it might have seemed arrogant. But David was prepared. I think he must have spent a lot of time out in the field taking care of those sheep, praying and seeking the Lord. He was a good boy. He loved God. Not only was did he no, no matter uh, whether internal fear came in front of David, it still did not hinder him. Secondly, family opposition did not hinder him. Verse 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, when he heard, he spake unto uh, he heard him speak unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why camest thou down hither? And he would begin to represent, reprimand his brother for even being amongst the army. There's going to be times when people, including our own families, may not agree with our stand and with our direction. But we've got to do it. We've got to fight the enemy with all our hearts and all our souls. Because there is a thread of blood that is flowing from Calvary. And that thread is straight. That road is narrow. And I'm still convinced it can't be broadened by anything or anybody. We must walk that road in purity. Right. Last, David was never hindered by internal fear, family opposition, or external foes. In verse 43, and the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. You see, it seems to me like in this text, none of this stuff bothered David. Maybe it's because, I, maybe I'm just sort of groping. Uh, maybe it's because he was young. I don't know. Maybe he didn't realize all the fear. Maybe that was good. The Bible says out of the mouth of babes. And I, I don't know if that means baby Christians or what it means. But, you know, he just didn't seem to be fearful. And you know the story of how it went. He took this. You know, that's what infuriated Goliath. That would have been the best weapon used. Well, you know, David was just short. And Saul was this tall guy. And tried to make him wear his, wear his uh, battle gear. Well, when he put it on, he couldn't even walk. And so he said, take it off of me. He probably sounded like he was in a can. Take it off of me. Took it off. I would think that the, the men of warfare bring our choice a sword. Bring the one with a pearl handle. The one that's the lucky sword. 
Let's give him that sword. Let's help him a little bit. Hey, brother over there, that sharp spear, bring it over here. That's the best we got. Bring it. They started, I'm sure, bring it in. I'm sure they did. Bring in all the best of, of fighting tools. David looked around, reached back, clasped, pulled out this little piece of gum. Had a little pouch in it. Started looking at the ground. I bet a lion got made. What's that dummy doing now? He comes out here, acts like a bold young, asking everybody their business, stand here watching the war. He has no business being here. He's only 13 or 14 years old. He'll be back to take care of the sheep where he belongs. David was walking away. Goliath saw him doing this. What are you doing? David didn't answer. I can't get down. I can't get I'm getting old. <laughs> Found a choice, have I believe David looked up to God. He said, I'm doing this for you, Lord. How many believe? I'm doing this for you, Lord. I'm not doing this to make a scene. I'm not doing this. David did not at that point even know that he was going to be anointed king. He did not know he was even going to be asked. He was just a young shepherd boy that felt heart throb of God. He came to be relieved. As he stood on the edge of that hill, that almost 12 and a half foot tall giant stood there standing in the face. He stood and he said, in the name of the Lord, yeah. I come to you. Talked at him, looked him right in the eye. He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. And he began to work on that I used to use her. How many have ever used one of them? With her accurate. I, I killed one rabbit with I, I, I did it at many rabbits, but only hit one. <laughs> but them things are fast and deadly. Me and my twin brother used to be able to reel you. He began to whirl that thing. Two strings, having the whole boat and let one go. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit, now listen to me, the Holy Spirit said on the next round, let her fly. I'll direct the study. Let it go. The Bible says you know the story. That stone, there was only one spot that was open on his body. Right between his eyes. That stone buried itself in his skull. The Bible says that man weaved and fell backwards to the ground. Dead. David wiped the sweat and said, Man, I'm glad that's over and ran from the camp. <laughs> Went back to his sheep. The Bible says, What have you done now? You see, when you get the devil running, looking good, you don't do what God does it. But make sure the job is finished. Yeah. David says, I don't trust this big dude. Now you can give me the sword. He took the sword and walked and the whole crap he did. The Bible says he pulled the helmet literally pulled it off and took him by his head by the hair. And he lifted it and cut his head off. And carried it back up to the inner life. And said, you're free. The God of gods and the Lord of lords has delivered his people. He sent a message to the Philistines. These people are free. It's not written that way exactly. I'm, I'm just talking in our own language. How many believe tonight that we as a church need to retrieve that kind of power and authority? You know, when the devil comes at us in every way, we shouldn't run or be frantic. 
I felt that last week. You know, and I don't really know for sure why. But I got victory over it. And I cut off the devil, but not the devil, but all right. In a, in a sense, at 5 o'clock in the morning, on Tuesday, on Tuesday morning, it would have been Monday night, I walked the floor, I know five hours, from 1 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock in the morning. Could not sleep, trembling for fear, for what I don't know. I mean, my body literally trembled. I said, God, what's wrong with you? What's going on inside of me? I, 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 and my wife even knew what was going on. She told me. And she knew what the devil was trying to do to me. And finally, I began to win the battle. I began to pray. We were in our Wednesday night study. We had a great crowd here, and we were talking about this Wednesday night. How many remember that? I began to, I began to pray in my prayer life. Pray in tongues. And I began to see the victory come. I began to feel the fear leave. The devil began to run. And God said, don't quit now. If you quit now, you won't have the victory. Pray through it. Cut his head off. I'm not saying liberal. You understand what I'm trying to say? Finish the job. And I've not had that fear since. The things that I face as a pastor are still there. But I don't have that fear. Because I won the battle. And I'm free. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? I want to ask just a couple questions. As we prepare to gather about these altars and seek Jesus tonight, praying for a mighty outpouring of God's Holy Spirit and power upon our church and upon us as, as people of the church. Tonight, maybe you're here and, and you know deep down in your own heart, Pastor, this battle sometimes almost gets too big for me. I experience those kind of things here. I'm not sure about what tomorrow holds. I don't know how things are going to be tomorrow in comparison to today. I don't understand what my future holds. But I want to be able to have power with God. I don't want any of these things that brought weakness to the country of Israel. When that whole country and that king who was anointed by God and anointed by the prophet could not stand up for himself and his people because of that fear. Because he had lost his condition, his relationship with God. This young boy had to come and clean up the mess. Tonight, folks, don't let it go that far. Don't lay, leave it go until someone else has to come in and do the job. God wants to give you the power and me the power to represent His church in this community. And not run from the power of, of the enemy, but stand strong and say, I have power in Jesus Christ. I shall not be if you're here, I'm going to ask you to step out of your seat and be the first to find your place at this altar. I'll not succumb to public opinion. I'll not succumb to family opposition. I'll not succumb to exterior foods. I'm going to do what i got to do. Because I know it's right. The spring is strength. Would you come? Let's begin to pray tonight that God will bring a powerful influx of not only His Holy Spirit, but a powered Word of God to become our foundation in our direction. I'm going to ask you to stand. Would you just begin to come about these? Let's spend some time in prayer tonight.